11th of May 1997, the then world champion of chess, Gary Kasparov, sat down to play a game against a rather unusual opponent, the IBM chess computer Deep Blue. And in a historic event, Deep Blue defeats Kasparov. So at the time there were some accusations that IBM could perhaps have cheated to achieve this, which raises the question, how could you possibly cheat? Because the whole purpose was to use a computer, and Kasparov was already the best human player in the world, so how would that be possible? Well, in theory it's possible to cheat with a human computer team, with the human using intuition and human intelligence to suggest possible moves, and the computer then number crunching those moves. So for me, the moral of this story is not that computers are now smarter and more intelligent than us, but that to solve problems, humans and computers should be working in collaboration. And I think that's true in science as well. But for this human side of the team to work properly, we need to see the same data that the computer can see. And that's increasingly large quantities of data. So this is where the field of data visualization is important. Here we are at Evolution 2015, and I'm going to talk to you about the visualization of evolutionary trees. Why those in particular? Because they're fundamental to the field of evolution. And because whilst we've seen tremendous advances in the building and analyzing of these trees in recent years, the visualization of them seems to be falling far behind still as a, as a niche uh, area of research. And I think that has to change. This is perhaps the first visualization of a tree with evolution in mind from Darwin's notebook there. And of course, he did this on a piece of paper. He didn't have a choice. The only computers at the time were made out of cogs and levers. But we've moved on beyond what I would call the paper paradigm now. We've moved on to... One of my slides has been deleted, that's annoying. Um, <laughs> We've moved on beyond the paper paradigm now. Uh, we are now using uh, computers to store and to transmit our data, uh, and that enables us to do new, bigger things that wasn't really possible with paper before. So, three years ago at the Evolution Conference, I presented to you a new way of visualizing evolutionary trees, which I called OneZoom. And the idea behind it was everything on one page, all you have to do is zoom. And unfortunately, I think the person who asked me, would you like to save changes to your talk? And I said, uh, <laughs> actually, it's slide must have been accidentally deleted. But I had a visualization there to show you what I presented three years ago. So I'll have to just describe it. It's like a tree, but it's also like a map. And the fundamental idea is that you zoom in to an area of interest to reveal further details, just like zooming in on Google Earth. And I think that's really a very intuitive way of visualizing large amounts of data, because it's the same way that we visualize the world around us. We just look around, and then if something interests us, we all come to it, and details just seamlessly appear ahead of us. So I think that is a fruitful way of visualizing data which moves away from the paper paradigm, from the old paper-based way of thinking about visualization to exploit the freedom that a computer screen would give us. So the purpose of my talk this morning is to show you some of the advances that have happened in this area, of one zoom in particular, in the three years since I first presented it. Ah, oh, that's actually the slide I wanted to show you. Could you just press play? Thank you, they've switched order. So here you go, this is what I showed before. Just zooming in here through the bats, through the Vespa bats. And you can see how, no matter how much data you have, you would always find a place to pin it on here, whether it's information on these interior nodes of the tree or on the leaves into this mysterious bat here. And actually one of the things I've quite liked about doing this project is you discover all the amazing vernacular names of things. Uh, some of my other favourites are the Screaming Hairy Armadillo and the Friendly leaf Eared Mouse. Uh, so, on to the advances then. This is a One Zoom Museum exhibit. And you'll see that it's, it's above what I just showed you from before. Uh, it's got a new revamped user interface here. It's of course on multi-touch. And it has images embedded on the signpost of these trees to help people navigate and to make it more visually appealing, which I think is so important for a public engagement. 
And also there's images on the leaves and on the interior nose of this tree. And we actually conducted surveys of users of this display in some of the early exhibitions and used that survey information to develop this uh, user interface into its current form. And one of the big things that we've added since the earlier versions of OneZoom is this breadcrumbs idea where if people zoom into this deep object, which actually in some places would be a piece of paper bigger than the universe in this plate, you get lost in that. But not anymore, because now these breadcrumbs show you where you've zoomed, and you can touch any of them, like the central magnets there, just to zoom back out and see the context of where you're exploring, and then choose somewhere else to zoom into and explore that seems interesting to you. So, just press play on that, please. This is uh, the, the museum display zooming in to show you what that looks like. Uh, this has appeared in six venues now, uh, in Europe, North America, and also Australia <coughs> soon. And hopefully there will be a sound here, because we have sounds as well. Yeah. This is the sound of a walrus, believe it or not. I, I still find that quite hard to believe, actually. It's amazing. Um, uh, this, so thanks to the British Library for those sounds uh, from the, the Sounds Archive, and also for featuring this in their beautiful science exhibition. Uh, for those that, that aren't going to the museums and places that do actually have this, there is a website, but also now an Android app. And uh, it has all the same kind of features as the website. So if you just press play here, I'll show you. So you can see, you can explore with multi-touch, and we had to solve some performance issues to get this to work on a small phone with uh, caching of images and loading of the tree in chunks. But it's basically functional. You can also search here for the Kakapo, and then look in Wikipedia all within the app. And there's also a little tutorial, so it should be quite self-explanatory. It's free, so anyone with an Android phone, not an iPhone yet, I'm afraid, so I can't use my own app annoyingly, but still, um, uh, still you can, uh, you can download it. Uh, then for other websites that want to have something a bit like OneZoom inbuilt to their own uh, page, they can go to the event part of OneZoom.org and see all of these uh, details, select them, just press play quickly, um, and then see a visualisation of zooming into the tree of their choosing with their own logos and colours and information and that could be embedded in their website just by copying and pasting the automatically generated code on the left there. There's also a OneZoom API coming along. This looks like everything else you've seen but it's been generated by code that is completely separate from the uh, original uh, OneZoom code uh, in the sense that all of this bio biology data is in a JSON file and the core program of visualisation has nothing to do with biology in it. So you can visualise really any hierarchy and have complete control over the way this, this works. So for example, you could declare at the root of bats there an inherited style which changes the way the tree looks just for bats in order to show something about wing length, which wouldn't be useful for other parts of the mammal tree. Another project, a spin-off of OneZoom, is ZoomCast. This is for visualisation of family trees, genealogies. Uh, so you can upload your own genealogy. Just press play. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. And you can also network with your friends and family on there. It's a social network too. And you can explore public genealogies, like this one, which is Queen Elizabeth II, uh, Queen of England. And we're just going to search there for Alfred the Great. Is a, an ancestor of the current queen born in the year 849. And you can see here, zooming through the genealogy to that person. When we get there in a moment, you'll see how the number of links just on the top left hand side, the, the relationship links between the queen and uh, uh, this person can all be explored there, all 34 of them. And also, Darwin's tree is there with some different styles. But of all these applications, the thing that excites me most of all is the possibility of making what I would describe as the Google Earth of biology. Uh, one page which contains all described life on Earth, not just the living species, but also the extinct species, fossils, evolutionary links, pictures, images, maps, 
Uh, I think that would really be a great educational and, and scientific tool. Now I know websites like Encyclopedia of Life and also the Urban Tree of Life project are making huge advances and collecting together the data we need to make this. And I think those projects are fantastic. I have something in mind that's complementary to those projects. Uh, if you could just share this. Something which focuses on combining ecology and evolutionary data and which focuses on the front end, on the ease of use. This is a, a, a sort of a mock-up of what the complete tree of life would look like in one zoo, just zooming out from humans there uh, to the dawn of all life. Uh, thanks incidentally to uh, Yan Wong for uh, producing this visualisation from the, the one zoo code. He's a member of the one zoo team, but he's also doing this for the Ancestors Tale book with Richard Dawkins, some of you may have heard of that being rewritten and is using one zoom visualizations. But hopefully this gives some of an idea of what it would be like to have the Google Earth of biology, to be able to not to be shown through with a, with a video like this, uh, but to be able to just choose where to go in this amazing world. That's really what uh, I'd like to create. And I think that's a different experience to reading a book where it's, it's a fixed story or uh, to exploring an encyclopedia where you need to know, for instance, that peacock spiders are interesting animals in order to type that into the search and find out about them. What if you don't even know they exist? With this, you could just explore and serendipitously find things. And I think that's an important uh, method of, of exploration. Imagine just for a moment a person who uh, doesn't really think they are interested in natural history or evolution but they certainly care about their pet dog. They could be taken from a Facebook advert or something to onto this page, starting around dogs and be exploring the different breeds and how they're related. And then before they know it, they've zoomed out and they see wolves. And you think, oh, wolves are pretty interesting as well. They're rather like dogs. So I feel like that makes sense to me now. And so they've become engaged in all of this evolution and biodiversity from a starting point of personal interest. So, that's what I'd like to see happen over the next uh, few years. It's been pretty tough to uh, get funding for this, uh, but I haven't given up yet, so my next uh, plan is to spin this off as an independent charity, to forge links with other organisations and to crowdfund to get the money necessary to build the Google Earth of Biology. So I hope that five years from now, Evolution 2020, say that I'll be able to, to stand up somewhere and say, here it is, it's done. And uh, with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much. And I, I will have the app and the museum display out to in the break just after this session for anyone to come and play with if they want. Thank you very much. manageable is 
to plug in, for instance, the Open Tree of Life project data, and as they update it, have a simple script that you can just run to update to one Zoom as well. And similarly, as, as Encyclopedia of Life updates, run a script to grab that updated data and include that here. So at the moment, I think struggling to, to get the funding to build this, even assuming we don't collate any data, uh, is, is enough of a job. If this, uh, with the crowdfunding, with the charity becomes really successful, then I think we would start looking at having some curators, having some trusted curators. So if I meet an expert here who, who's, who loves poison dart frogs and knows everything about them, then I would certainly say, oh, you can be in charge of that node then and we trust you to, to deal with it properly. But I don't think it could ever be an open public thing. Because just, it just then becomes unreliable. We want it to be scientifically accurate. That's a key thing.